Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this UKLFI Charitable Trust webinar and this discussion on the law of armed conflict and the rule of proportionality. After the latest round of violence in Gaza, the media and commentators are once again levying the charge of disproportionate conduct at Israel. And this is in the context of the Israeli military's efforts to avoid civilian casualties in the densest of urban conflict environments against an opponent uh, that actively uses civilians as human shields, both hiding among and launching attacks from civilian protected facilities. Well, to unpack what the principle of proportionality actually means and to look at the application of international humanitarian law generally and in relation to Israel's conduct, I'm tremendously grateful to be joined by Professor Jeffrey Korn the Gary A. Kuyper Distinguished Professor of National Security Law at the South Texas College of Law in Houston, and a retired US Army Lieutenant Colonel. Now, his Army career included service as both an intelligence officer and a military attorney. He was the Chief of International Law for Headquarters for the US Army Europe, Professor of International Law and National Security Law at the US Army Judge Advocate General School and Senior Law of War Expert Prof uh, Advisor, forgive me, for the Judge Advocate General and the Chief of the Law of War Branch. He's acted as an expert witness also at the Military Commission in Guantanamo and the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And we, ladies and gentlemen, are able to draw on his legal and practical experience of the law of armed conflict. Professor Kern, Korn, forgive me, is also the lead author of the Law of Armed Conflict and Operational Perspective, The Laws of War and the War on Terror, and co-author of um, The Principles of Counterterrorism Law. He is a leading expert in the subject, and we're very grateful indeed that you are joining us from the United States today. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your questions into the Q&A facility and I will be putting them to our guest. But Professor Korn, could I ask you to begin by outlining for our audience what the principle of proportionality means? Yes, so first off, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you and your audience. I think it's very important that we have a clear and accurate understanding of the law that regulates the conduct of hostilities during armed conflict, which is what this discussion is about. So the term proportionality has different meanings in different contexts. And it's important <clears throat> at the outset that we clarify the context that I'm going to focus on. There are basically three applications of what we would call the principle of proportionality. One is at a national self-defense level. So the requirement that if a nation is responding to unlawful aggression, or the imminent threat of unlawful aggression that it use, that its, its overall response be proportional to that threat. That would be similar to any individual who's been the victim of an unlawful attack, having a privilege of defending himself, but only being able to use the amount of force needed to achieve that goal. That's what international lawyers call the use ad bellum, the legality of war. Uh, another context of proportion, proportionality is peacetime application of the principle when government agents use force to enforce the law. So when we think of a police officer using force, we always ask, was that use of force proportional, which means <clears throat> it was only the amount of force needed to respond to the actual threat that the officer faced. In the conduct of hostilities, proportionality means something very different. The most fundamental difference between peacetime proportionality and what we might call wartime proportionality is that the principle of proportionality does not function to protect the enemy forces from attack. The function of proportionality is to limit the indiscriminate effects of an otherwise lawful attack on an enemy fighter or enemy military objective. In other words, the focus of the proportionality analysis is not whether your attack is going to harm the enemy. It's whether your attack to harm the enemy is going to incidentally harm innocent civilians or their property. And at that point, the commander has to make an, a, an, a judgment 
based on the best information available, whether or not that civilian risk is considered excessive in relation to what we call the concrete and direct military advantage the commander anticipates. But to really understand this, what you have to understand is that proportionality is part of a broader equation of what we call the targeting process. Now, this process applies whether we're dealing with a what we might call a deliberate or pre-planned attack where the commander has <clears throat> substantial time to consider all the facts and circumstances related to the attack, or even if it's a <clears throat> time sensitive attack where there's a short notice decision to use force against an enemy. What I'd like to do is share <clears throat> a diagram that is a kind of simple layout of these, this process that a commander or even a soldier on the ground would be expected to go through to comply with the law related to the conduct of hostilities before employing force. So if we take a, a nominated target, let's take a, a thing like a building. Uh, the first question the commander has to decide is whether or not the target qualifies as a military objective. Now, international law defines a military objective as any item, place, or thing that is being used by the enemy to give the enemy an advantage, and if it's attacked and destroyed or degraded, will offer the attacking force a definite military advantage. And an item or thing or place can be a military objective by its nature, by its location, by its purpose, or by its use. So nature is pretty simple. A military objective by nature would be a military facility like a barracks or a military airfield or a military port or something like that. Most of the targets that the Israeli commanders had to deal with were not gonna qualify as military by nature because the enemy was using civilian buildings and areas to locate its military activities. So then the commander has to decide whether the location, the use, or the purpose of that facility made it a military objective because attacking it would offer a definite military advantage. So for example, if the enemy puts a command and control facility inside a civilian uh, structure, like an apartment building, then the use of that building transforms that building into a military objective because its destruction will offer a definite military advantage. Of course, if the commander concludes that there's no military advantage to attacking the target, then it remains civilian and there's no authority to attack. Once it's determined that the proposed target is a military objective, the next thing the commander has to assess is whether or not attacking that target will create risk of collateral damage or incidental injury to civilians or civilian property. Now, if the conclusion is I can attack the target while creating no risk to civilians, for example, if I find an enemy convoy in the middle of the desert, I'm done with my analysis legally. I'm authorized to attack that target using the amount of force that the commander determines is appropriate to achieve the military objective. And that's because the rules that are designed to limit the application of combat power are designed to protect civilians and civilian property, not the enemy forces. That's why it's permissible to use overwhelming force to attack an enemy. It's also why when I was a young soldier, I was taught when I was learning how to use my rifle to fire three shots at center mass when I identify an enemy fighter because the use of deadly force as a first resort is permissible as a result of the law of armed conflict, whereas in peacetime that would not be permissible because in peacetime the police officer would be required to use proportional force against the deliberate object of violence. In most cases, in modern warfare, it's gonna be almost impossible to conduct an attack on a military objective without creating some risk to the civilian population or civilian property. 
So as a result, if we say, yes, there will be risk to civilians, the next requirement, and the one that's often overlooked, is the requirement to take all feasible precautions. Military commanders bear an obligation to use constant care to mitigate the risk of, to civilians as a result of military operations. And when contemplating an attack, there's a requirement that they consider all feasible precautions to mitigate that risk. This precautionary principle is a, uh, it's a medium between the decision that something is a military objective and the proportionality rule. The idea behind it, if you think about it, is we want the commander to mitigate as much as feasible the risk to the civilian population before the commander has to make the ultimate proportionality decision. So what are the things that fall into this category of feasible precautions? There's a wide range of, of decisions or measures a commander can take. For example, the timing of an attack. Do I attack at night when the civilians are off the street or during the day? The location of the attack. Is there another military objective I can attack that will give me the same military advantage but will reduce the risk to the civilian population? The choice of weapons and tactics. So for example, can I attack the target with a precision munition versus an artillery bar barrage? Issuing warnings. If it's feasible, if I have the capability to issue the warning and issuing the warning will not substantially compromise my military advantage, I have an obligation to do so. Providing the opportunity for civilians to evacuate the area. Creating safe havens for the civilians if possible. These are all precautionary measures, as is the effort to verify the true nature of the target. We shouldn't underestimate the role of intelligence in informing the commander that what he's attacking is in fact a legitimate military objective. If the commander has not implemented these precautions, then the commander has to reconsider them. Once all feasible precautions have been implemented, then we reach the ultimate decision of proportionality. Now on this precautionary measures issue, one of the reasons I think it's so important is because it is in my view, some of the most significant circumstantial evidence we can look at to determine whether or not we're dealing with a commander that's acting in good faith to comply with the humanitarian obligations of the law of armed conflict. In other words, a commander that is bending over backwards to implement feasible precautions is a commander that we know is concerned about mitigating the risk to the civilian population while at the same time achieving legitimate military objectives. If after implementing those, those precautions, there is still a risk to the civilian population, then the ultimate obligation is to refrain from launching what the law defines as an indiscriminate attack. Now there are different ways an attack can be indiscriminate. One way is to launch an attack without targeting a specific objective. For example, uh, just shooting missiles into Israel without any effort to identify or attack a specific military objective. That would be an indiscriminate attack. Another way an attack can be indiscriminate is if you're using a weapon that you're unable to control once it's released. So for example, when Hamas launches its incendiary balloons, that's an indiscriminate attack because they can't control where it's going to land and they can't control the effect of the weapon after it lands. And the third way an attack can be indiscriminate is if the risk to the civilian population or civilian property is assessed as excessive in comparison to the anticipated military advantage. That's what we commonly call the proportionality rule. And if the commander determines that the attack will result in excessive civilian risk, then it's indiscriminate and it's illegal and the commander should refrain from launching the attack. However, if the commander concludes that the civilian risk will not be excessive compared to the military advantage anticipated, that means the law indicates that the attack is lawful. Now, let's drill down a little bit deeper into this proportionality rule. A couple of really critical points that we have to bear in mind. The first off is 
The first is when you're assessing compliance with the proportionality rule, it's not a post hoc analysis. We don't look at the effects of an attack and then extrapolate back from that, that the attack was ipso facto disproportionate. Although that's what the media and many commentators like to do. They engage in what I've called effects-based condemnation. In other words, we look at the effects of an attack and then we extrapolate back from that, that it must have been illegal. So for example, when the IDF attacked the building that housed uh, certain media organizations, there was an immediate outcry of condemnation that that must have been illegal. The problem with that approach is that it distorts the proper function of the law. A commander is not held to a standard of perfection. A commander is held to a standard of reasonableness. And that requires recreating the decision-making process and deciding whether or not the commander's judgment was reasonable based on all the available facts and circumstances. So if, if you take that to its logical endpoint, what it means is that commanders are permitted to make mistakes in war. Anybody who thinks that war is a mistake-free zone is naive and doesn't understand the fog of war. The requirement is that when we look at the commander's decision-making process, the judgment, we have to determine that under the circumstances, the judgment was reasonable at the time the decision to launch the attack was made. So the commander is balancing the anticipated risk to the civilian population on one hand against the anticipated military advantage of launching the attack on the other. And the commander has to make that very difficult judgment, which is I know that if I launch the attack, it's going to result in civilian casualties, but that um, the, the, those casualties are acceptable within the meaning of the law because of the value of launching the attack to my overall military operation. That's the first point. Ex ante analysis, not post hoc analysis. Now, the second point is the effects of an attack are not irrelevant. We look at the effects of an attack as circumstantial evidence of whether the decision to launch the attack was lawful. So the effects of attack are what we would call probative. They help prove legality or illegality, but they are rarely, if ever, dispositive, meaning it's erroneous to look only at the effects to decide whether or not an attack was lawful, especially when the effects result in civilian casualties. And this raises another point about the precautions obligation. The precautions obligation does not apply only to the attacking force. There's also an obligation on what we might call the defending force or the, the party to the conflict that's being attacked, they bear an obligation to take all feasible measures to mitigate risk to the civilian population as well. So the law says that you should refrain from locating military objectives in the midst of civilian populations. And the law makes it illegal to use civilians in an effort to shield your targets from attack, the use of human shields. So what this means is that when we assess compliance with the proportionality rule and we assess compliance with the law of armed conflict more broadly, we have to be very careful about the tendency to conflate direct cause with legal responsibility. Direct cause is often easy to identify. The party that drops the bomb is the direct cause for the destruction of a building. But the legal responsibility for the civilian casualties is very often at the feet of the defending party because they breach their obligation to mitigate risk to civilians. And in fact, in the realm of conflicts, for example, in Gaza or against non-state enemies that understand the international media space and the risk of compromised legitimacy for their enemy, I think there's an even more aggravated form of exploiting the presence of civilians. In my view, what Hamas does is they almost want civilian casuals, casualties to occur on their side of the battle line. So first, they're launching indiscriminate attacks against the civilian population of Israel, which is a per se violation of the law. 
because they're not even targeting military objectives. And then on their side of the battle line, they are deliberately exposing civilians to the risk of death or injury in order to create an international sympathy that will contribute to the delegitimization of Israel in the broader public space. As one of the great commanders I worked with in 2014 on the study of the Gaza conflict put it, when I was a young officer, information was a supporting effort to combat. But what I learned about Hamas was that combat is a supporting effort to their information campaign. In other words, they don't care about winning the battle. They care about using civilian casualties to win the strategic information campaign. So I think in many ways, what we see in Gaza is a deliberate attack on civilians by Hamas itself. They're just using the IDF as their instrumentality to inflict that death or injury which is an even more aggravated form of human shielding. Because if you think of shielding, the idea is that you don't want the enemy to attack. And I think what we see are situations where they're baiting the enemy into attacking in order to produce those civilian casualties. And the third point I wanna emphasize is that the proportionality rule, as you saw through that line and block chart, is never even an issue if you're not launching your attack against a legitimate military objective. What Hamas does is it violates the first principle, which is the principle of distinction, because it's not even attacking a military objective. It's just launching rockets into Israel to deliberately attack civilians. And there is never a justification in the law for deliberately launching an attack against civilians. Civilian casualties are an unfortunate and legally tolerable consequence of armed conflict, but only if those casualties are an incidental consequence of launching an attack on a lawful target. What's never tolerated is a deliberate attack on civilians, which is the most egregious violation of the law and which is endemic in these type of operations. And one more point, because I know Natasha wants me to stop. If we look at this from the perspective of an ex ante analysis, in other words, we're not looking at the outcome of the attack to decide compliance with the law, we're looking at the decision to attack. Then the equation of illegitimacy changes fundamentally. That is what rebuts the argument that if one side suffers 200 casualties, and the other side only suffers 20, then the side that suffered 20 must have been the illegal side of the attack. What we really ought to be doing is asking how many civilian casualties did Hamas attempt to inflict? How many did they intend to inflict? And fortunately, that intent was not manifested in a result. That is what deserves the greatest condemnation. So if we want to talk about 200 civilian casualties in Gaza, and by the way, the evidence suggests that that number is greatly exaggerated, that most of those casualties were actually legitimate targets because they were enemy operatives. But even if we assume, arguendo, that 200 civilians were killed in Gaza, incidentally, if, the Hamas, if Hamas attempted to kill 2,000 civilians in Israel deliberately, that is a far more egregious violation or indication of violation of the law than the, the argument of disproportional effect of the Israeli attacks. And I know I was rushing, but Natasha gave me no more than 25 minutes and I'm at 24. Professor, thank you ever so much. Far be it for me to, to seek to cut short such an incredible overview. The questions have been streaming in. Um, okay. and I do want to pick up that question of, of the casualties and the analysis that we've had since uh, the conflict last month. But Israel, it does appear, has strictly applied the rules that you've uh, given this overview of. The Israeli army is one of the few in the world um, also to have legal advisors in the battle command centers posted to ensure compliance with these rules. Um, appreciate from your overview, proportionality is first off incident specific. And that is, it, it doesn't look at aggregate casualty numbers or damage and ask um, 
whether they are in some overall or general sense proportional, it looks rather at each specific targeting incident and asks whether the commander in that case used proportional force. But well, we made, a, made a reasonable judgment Indeed. that the attack would comply with the proportionality rule. Again, when we say use proportional force, we're suggesting we should focus on the results of the attack. What we have to focus on is the decision to launch the attack. And in terms of the Israeli targeting procedures in, in question, I mean, they're unquestionably impressive. They involve elaborate series of uh, legal reviews for pre-planned operations and targeting, a, of course, the system of warnings to civilians, um, often using calls to individuals, text messages, dropping leaflets, uh, encouraging evacuation of targeted facilities, and the use of um, real-time surveillance from drones in many cases, uh, and indeed even new techniques, uh, the so-called knock-on roof, uh, using the uh, small, relatively harmless, harmless munitions on the roofs of buildings to give those within a last warning to get out. Um, and it strikes me we've also seen uh, impressive footage of certain strikes at buildings which seem to leave the majority of the building intact while taking out a particular um, floor or even just a, a part of it, no doubt through careful calculation of, of the size of the munition. Um, it strikes me that no other military, including the British Army or, or indeed the American Armed Forces, goes to quite these lengths and takes such measures as a matter of routine, all designed to make sure that individual operations comply with the principles of distinction, uh, proportionality and, and minimize civilian harm. Do you anticipate these sorts of techniques being more broadly applied by other uh, Western uh, armies? There's a lot to unpack there. So let me make a couple of points. First off, again, if we, if we fall into the trap of effects-based condemnation, then all of those efforts are nullified in the, in the public discourse. In other words, all we're looking at is the result. And we're saying the result must indicate that something wrong happened, even though you have a commander who's bending over backwards to do everything possible to mitigate the risk to civilians. I would push back on you a little bit on the argument that no other military is committed to this level of civilian risk mitigation. There is a difference in every operation in what is feasible. So, for example, you can't send text messages uh, to lots of civilians in Afghanistan because number one, most of them don't have the, the technology to receive it. And number two, you don't have the benefit of having a roster of everybody's phone number. So what we see in the US military, in the UK military, in the Israeli military, in the French and other militaries is a simple concept here. And it's an important concept because it rebuts uh, a widespread misconception. The widespread misconception is that these commanders who are launching these attacks are indifferent to the, to the suffering that's gonna be inflicted by conducting military operations. And by the way, I think part of that misconception is a result that so many people in the world who are observing conflict on television, on media, uh, on YouTube, have never been in the military. They've never served under commanders. In fact, in the, if you talk to most people in these militaries who've served in combat, what they will tell you is there are very few people who are more sensitive, more concerned about mitigating risk to the civilian population than commanders. Why? Because they have to live with the consequence of their decisions. And that's not an easy thing to ask of, of someone, to say your job, is to decide to launch an attack knowing that doing so is going to result in civilian casualties. It's legal. As a legal advisor, this is what I would tell the commander. Sir, I believe that it's, a, it's legal. Now the commander is carrying that weight on his or her shoulders. I have to say, pull the trigger. So all of these efforts to mitigate risk are more than just legal um, requirements to protect the civilian population. They also protect the moral integrity of the, of the men and women we send into combat. We want them to come out at the other end believing and knowing that they did the best they could to mitigate risk to the civilian population. 
And more importantly, we want them to know that the commanders they served under did everything they could do to help the subordinate avoid having to inflict harm on a civilian. That's why I said early on that these precautions are an undervalued principle because what they really indicate is the commitment of commanders and subordinates to the humanitarian objectives of the law. They're struggling to walk that tightrope through the abyss of mortal combat. And in many cases, they assume risk. Commanders will say, okay, I know I don't have to issue a warning. I know, lawyer, that you're telling me I could get away with not doing it, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm gonna err on the side of caution, even if it means I'm gonna compromise my military advantage to a certain degree. So you asked the ultimate question, do I think that the high standard that the IDF uses is going to create constraints in future operations? What we have to understand is that every military operation is distinct and unique. Even in Israel, if the IDF has to engage Hezbollah in, in Southern Lebanon, the equation is very different than Hamas in Gaza. They might not be able to take the same level of feasible measures to mitigate civilian risk. And if we don't understand that the precautions that a commander implements are, are operationally contingent, then what will happen is an immediate condemnation that says, well, you did it last time in Gaza, you should have done the exact same thing in, in uh, Lebanon, and that's unrealistic. And it's unfair. It's an unfair burden to put on the commander. We've had uh, a number of questions coming in about the way that what you've described is, is being perceived and certainly presented in the media. That The trouble is, uh, at least colloquially, the use of the terms proportionality and proportional uh, are intended to incorporate several other ideas, um, which play not only on the asymmetry of the armed conflict against terrorist groups, uh, but also in the specific case of the Gaza conflicts, the term is also distorted by reference to uh, Israel's particularly strong civilian defense systems against Hamas rockets, the, the Iron Dome system. Um, so the questions that have been coming in and in the context of that is uh, how we can perhaps better educate the media to be presenting this uh, more accurately and, and indeed to uh, cease the misuse uh, and uh, perhaps even abuse of the terms proportionality and, and distinction in their reporting. Well, I, look, I think that's an uphill struggle. And the reason is because the media instinctively is going to gravitate to effects. And once again, what are they looking at? They're looking at the effects of combat. So if you have an effective uh, missile defense system, it means that you are going to mitigate the uh, harmful effect of the enemy's effort to deliberately target your civilian population. From a media perspective, that means that they would rather cover the story of the destroyed building in Gaza than cover the story of the attempted destroyed building in Israel. That's natural. What we need are uh, experts who are able to digest this very quickly and very simply for the media. And we need the, to encourage the media to bring those experts into the discussion. My experience has been that um, it's a mixed bag. I've dealt with certain media outlets that have been very interested in getting what they perceived was an accurate understanding of the law. Others, less so. But if you put yourself in the position of a reporter, what could you otherwise expect? They're going to gravitate towards where the destruction occurs. What we need to do is emphasize that that, is, that distorts the, the rationale of the law, and it basically says to the commander on the other side, all that effort you made to mitigate risk was for naught because the enemy has created a situation where you have no option other than to launch the attack and yet you still end up being condemned even though you're trying to do the right thing. There's a, there's a really pernicious bigotry of dual expectations that is applied when democracies fight illicit non-state groups. Part of it is the David and Goliath phenomenon, right? That you've got one side that's got all this capability 
And the other side has to cheat a little bit to have a fair fight. But the law doesn't tolerate that. The law is equally applicable to all sides because ultimately it's not about which side wins and loses. It's about preventing the civilian populations on both sides from being victims of the armed conflict. That's the main purpose of the humanitarian regulation of hostilities. So this bigotry of dual expectations instinctively leads commentators to kind of implicitly forgive the violation of the, of the, the less capable side and gravitate towards anything they can identify for the stronger side to indicate violation. So part of it is transparency. The military has to be transparent with its information. For example, if the, if the media is immediately condemning the attack on a building and saying it's disproportional, somebody has to get out in front of the media and say, that's like saying one plus I don't know equals five. Because if you don't know what the value of the target was, there is no way you can condemn the attack as disproportionate. You just don't know the equation. What you have to do is be transparent about what was there, why it was attacked, what precautions were implemented, and then that puts the attack judgment into proper context. That context is hard to establish in a, in a one or two minute sound clip. That's a reality and the enemy knows it. The enemy knows that, that delegitimization is the ultimate Achilles heel of uh, a democracy's military operations. And by the way, this has broader consequence. If you think about the, the, the very frightening and hopefully completely hypothetical possibility that there might be a conflict in the future between NATO and Russia, just take that for example. The Russians understand that disunity of the alliance is NATO's Achilles heel. So what are they going to do? They're going to create situations that make the public lose faith in NATO operations by increasing the risk to the civilian population. They learn from all of these operations and they see what happens in the media when the law and the narrative is fundamentally distorted. Yes, there are so many questions coming in. Uh, I want to come back to the specific example of the El Jala building, uh, which a number of people have asked about in relation to um, your description of, of coming out with the facts as soon as possible. But moving on just in the interim from the media perception of this, um, we've had a question uh, that reads, understanding the anti-Israel bias taught in many universities in the USA and the UK, how are your views received in your own university? Of course, it's not just the media, but increasingly uh, academia that is um, th that is commentating on these issues in, in perhaps a troubling fashion. Yeah. Well, um, first off, I'm not. Our law school is a standalone law school, so it's just a law school. It's about a thousand students, and I have to say, I'm very proud of our students for their willingness to be open-minded about learning the law. They have very strong opinions about what they're seeing in the media. But we've had, for example, we had a presentation by Colonel Ellie Baron a couple of years ago that was sponsored, co-sponsored by the Jewish Law Student Society and the Islamic Law Student Society. They wanted to learn more about what was going on. I think we're an outlier. I think that the um, public perception is that Israel is uh, a Goliath that is indifferent towards the suffering of the Palestinian population and everything they do deserves to be condemned. I mean, it's almost comical to, in, to a certain degree. So you get the, the dual condemnation of being an apartheid state engaged in genocide. You can't have both. It's got to be one or the other. If you're engaged in genocide, you're not apartheid anymore and vice versa. One of the problems, Natasha, that I, that I really try and push back against is that people seem incapable of segregating different aspects of the situation. So they conflate everything. If you're occupying the West Bank, if you're building settlements, then everything you're doing must be wrong. I'm not an expert on occupation law. I'm not an expert on the settlements. I'm an expert on the conduct of hostilities. And I look at that distinctly. So even if you wanna argue that Israeli policies towards the West Bank are deeply troubling or even illegal, that in no way 
excuses Hamas from deliberately launching attacks on the civilian population, nor does it negate the good faith of the Israeli military to try and follow the law when it's conducting its operations as best it can. We have to talk about these issues as distinct legal domains, because if we conflate them all, it's just going to lead to complete distortion and serve the interests of the parties to the conflict that don't care about the law and only care about delegitimization. Well, coming back now for a moment then to, um, to the impact of individual attacks. Um, after every round of conflicts with Gaza, there is eventually some assessment made of the reported casualties, attempts to identify terrorists and civilians. And at the beginning of June, the Mayor Amit Intelligence Terrorism Information Center published an examination of the names of the fatalities uh, in uh, strikes during the first two days of the latest operation, Operation Guardian of the Walls. And it revealed that the majority were terrorist operatives. Uh, the center examined 74 names of fatalities reported by Palestinian sources. 16 of them were killed during the unsuccessful launch of rockets from Gaza at Israel. But the report concludes uh, from the examination that of the 58 remaining fatalities, at least 42, so approximately two thirds, were terrorist operatives. Uh, according to following distribution, 31 Hamas operatives, three Palestinian Islamic Jihad operatives and eight Fatah members. Um, with that in mind, what is your impression of the casualty ratio in 2000? 14 versus this in, in 2001, where some estimates from the IDF uh, have the ratio at one to one. Before I answer that question, is, is the dog barking becoming a problem? I think we can work our way through it. It's certainly okay, cause atmospheric. Because I, I can take a brief pause and put them outside. If I need to. Should we see how we go? Okay. So first off, the fact that Let's assume those statistics are accurate for the point of discussion. That is another manifestation of the effort that the IDF engages in as a precautionary measure to identify the legitimacy of a target, right? And it's pretty remarkable because historically, at least since World War II, the ratio of, of enemy fighter to civilian killed in conflict is somewhere between five to 10 to one civilian to military. That's a tragic reality of war. And, and that ratio is substantially increased in urban conflict, okay? So if that those numbers are true, it, it demonstrates a few things. Number one, again, I keep going back to it, the deleterious effect of effects-based condemnation, right? You see a dead body, nobody likes to see a dead body. Don't get me wrong whether it's enemy or friendly. That's sad that someone's lost their life, but the immediate assumption that that was a civilian that was killed, we know is oftentimes wrong. And that's because the assumption is based on incomplete information. So that's one problem. Uh, it, it distorts the narrative of compliance with the law. Another problem is that it fails to acknowledge the effort that the IDF makes in good faith to limit its attacks to only those individuals who actually qualify as lawful targets within the meaning of the law. Uh, it also negates the ability to consider whether the attack was legally justified if it killed civilians in close proximity. And there's another point about this. You mentioned earlier that one of the, the the aspects of Israeli operations that's notable. It, you said that, that there have even been situations where it appears they can attack a building and destroy just one room and not the entire building. The development of weapons and tactics that enable the military to achieve its military objective in such a precise and limited way is itself a precautionary measure. So if we want to assume that those statistics are wrong, let's just hypothesize that out of the 200 or so casualties, 150 were civilian. We'll take that as a hypothesis. Compare that to 2014. In 2014, the casualty rate was substantially higher. 
almost 10 times higher. And the reason was obvious because the Israeli military was caught off guard by the tunnels and had to conduct a ground operation, a combined arms maneuver operation in densely populated areas in order to achieve its military objective. That by its very nature is going to increase the risk of civilian casualties. What happens in the next seven years? The IDF apparently devotes substantial effort to developing new weapons and new tactics to enable them to achieve their objective of reducing Hamas threat capability without having to conduct a ground maneuver operation. And that results in a 10 times reduction in casualties. And yet, instead of applauding that outcome and recognizing the importance of all those efforts to provide military commanders with options that mitigate the risk to the civilian population, the instinct is to just gravitate on the end number and say, because you didn't suffer equal casualties, there must be something wrong about what's happening here. I mentioned that we'd had a number of questions on uh, one particular strike in uh, the Gaza Strip last month on the Al Jala Tower, uh, which caused a, a lot of coverage, um, primarily because it also housed uh, international media and including substantially the main offices of Al Jazeera. Um, it's a particular example from the last round of violence, um, which has been subject to criticism. Um, immediately after there was, of course, a, a tweet from the IDF explaining its reasoning for the attack, um, noting in particular it was an important base for Hamas military operations, uh, intelligence gathering um, for attacks against Israel, and subsequently we've also found it to be the um, headquarters of the anti-Iron Dome operations. Um, what do you make of the criticism about that particular building being a military objective? Um, and if you could also comment, because a number of people have asked specifically, the warning that Israel gave um, in advance of this strike enabled the building to be cleared, not just of the international journalists that were present, but of course also of any Hamas operatives, um, who it seems also removed some substantial equipment from the building. Does that have any impact on the status of that target as a military target, a valid military target? Well, let's start with the last question first. Remember, the law of military objective me indicates that a building can become a military objective by its use or its purpose. So if you know the enemy is using the building to house its important military activities, and you issue a warning and they evacuate the building, if you know they're going to go right back into the building if you don't attack it, then its future purpose is sufficient to render it a military objective. And I know that there are some experts who made the argument that once it was evacuated, it ceased being a military objective. That's just patently wrong. That's certainly not the advice I or any of the experienced military lawyers that I know in the US military would give a commander. The people who evacuated the building continue to be military objectives wherever they are. But if you make a reasonable assessment that they're going to go back and reoccupy the building and use it for its military advantage, then it is by purpose a military objective. In terms of uh, the attack itself, isn't it ironic that all of the criticism immediately gravitated towards the IDF for attacking the building because it was also used for certain for journalists? Where was the criticism of Hamas? for locating its military activities in a building it knows is being used by journalists. Now, why would they do that? Hmm, I wonder. Maybe they do it because they know whatever happens, they win. If the IDF chooses not to attack the building because they're worried about the blowback, then Hamas wins because their target is immunized. And if Israel decides that it has no other option other than attack the building, then Hamas wins because Israel will be delegitimized for attacking a building that was used by uh, journalists. It's, it is the ultimate manifestation of the detrimental effect of distorting the way the law is intended to work. And I sent you a link earlier to an article I wrote um, that, that discusses the danger of conflating cause and responsibility. The responsibility 
for the destruction of that building falls squarely at the feet of Hamas. Because Hamas is the party that was using it illegally and contrary to the principles of the law in an effort to shield its military activities from the IDF. Now, if we were to learn that the IDF misrepresented the facts, if we were to learn that there was no military advantage to launching that attack, then very significant criticism and scrutiny should be applied to the military commander in the IDF who authorized that attack. The odds of that being true, I think, are de minimis. Because if that were true, if the objective of the IDF was to deliberately attack the journalists, then they never would have gone through all the effort to issue the warnings to let the building evacuate. So the fact that they knew that the warning would allow Hamas operatives to get out of the building, to me, is pretty powerful circumstantial evidence that their objective was to avoid harming the journalists, not to inflict harm on the journalists. And here's why. Because if we go through that methodology I used, and you know the enemy has a command and control center in a building that also houses journalists, that makes it a military objective you decide that issuing a warning is not feasible because it's gonna allow the enemy to evacuate the building. That's a reasonable judgment. Then you make the decision that the value of destroying that enemy command and control center is so significant that it justifies the risk to the civilians in the building, you could attack. Arguably, the Israelis could have launched that attack without a warning, that's my point. The fact that they gave the warning knowing it would give an advantage to the enemy is powerful evidence that they were actually not trying to violate the law. We've had a number of questions relating to the International Criminal Court. Uh, of course, um, they have been watching closely the events of last month. Uh, so the, pros the previous prosecutor, Ben Suda, indicated, uh, and now the new prosecutor, Karim Khan, will, will have to grapple with this material. Um, and so one of these questions reads, do you believe that the International Criminal Court interprets the law as you have described? If so, based on your knowledge of Israel's actions, both in 2014 and last month, do you believe Israel has much to fear from cases brought against it if properly defended? So I, I'll, I'll start by sharing my bias. My bias is that I, when, when the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia was, was created and I was teaching as a major in the Army JAG school, I thought this was a great development. We hadn't had a war crimes tribunal since post-World War II. But as I saw it progress, I became increasingly discouraged with the um, ability of these courts to deal with what I would call complex conduct of hostilities cases. Now, I think the court does really good work when there are very obvious and blatant violations of international law. But when you are assessing the legality of an attack decision in a complex urban environment, against an enemy that doesn't follow the rules and against an enemy that uses civilians and the presence of civilians in an effort to shield its military objectives or maybe even get the civilians killed, that is very hard to recreate after the fact. So my experience when I was an expert witness for the defense in the case of Prosecutor V. Godovina really played this out because what I realized was we have laid not, you have, we have judges who are not experts in war sitting in judgment of commanders who are in the fog of war and they're trying to sort all this out. I think it's a tremendous challenge for the tribunal. The real challenge for the tribunal in my view is whether it's willing to acknowledge that what may seem to be a violation of the law cannot be established beyond a reasonable doubt but to a criminal standard. In other words, we just don't have enough information. We don't have enough information to reach a judgment. That's a hard thing for a tribunal to do because the expectation is you reach a judgment. That's what you do. Does Israel have anything to fear? If I believe if the ICC applies the law in good faith 
the way it was intended to function, then the only thing an Israeli commander has to fear is a situation where the commander justifiably is deserving of condemnation because of an indifference towards the law or towards the civilian population. And I don't think that's gonna be the case in any of these attack decisions. So if the law is properly applied, I don't think IDF commanders have anything to fear, but I'm not confident that that's the case. And, I, and if I were an IDF commander, I would be a little bit concerned of the sword of Damocles dangling over my head if a tribunal decides that based on the effects, we don't like what happened and therefore we're gonna ignore all of the efforts you made to comply with the law and simply say, because of what happened, and, and the result of your attack, you must have been acting illegally, which by the way, is what I think the tribunal did to General Godovina. Now, fortunately for him, the appellate chamber set aside the conviction. And why did they set it aside? Because uh, Judge Merrin did the right thing and said, we just don't have enough information to support guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The real challenge for the ICC is following the legal burden of proving a violation of the law when you're, when you're recreating an attack decision based on incomplete information. Well, we will see uh, the new prosecutor's approach to this. You will no doubt know from your own experience as well, um, the answer to this question, has any country or army other than Israel been investigated or criticized um, internationally for disproportionate use of force since the Second World War? Well, I think the answer to that is yes. There have been other militaries that have been criticized for disproportionate use of force. But again, I think that we have this bigotry of, of disparate expectations. So, so for example, when the Russians were fighting in Chechnya, there was widespread indiscriminate use of force, but we didn't hear very much about it. It's almost as if it's okay. If it's, a, if, it's a, if it's a military that's not as what we might say professional as what we expect out of the US or Israel or the UK, there's almost like a forgiveness or a pass that occurs. There is a lot of internal critique of military decision-making and a lot of people are unfamiliar with that. There is an obvious interest among leadership in the military to look very carefully at the way decisions were made to make sure that subordinate commanders are following the rules, are properly trained, and that our procedures are effective. You mentioned earlier that the IDF is, um, is kind of a leader in integrating military legal advisors into the operational decision-making process. Uh, and I, I think that the United States is really at the pinnacle of that, but you're right. The Israeli military has some of the finest military lawyers I've ever met in my life, and they're incredibly talented and integrated into all phases of the operation. That is a progression. That has not always been the case. If you talk to the military lawyers who were serving in the IDF 20 or 25 years ago, they would say, we never had a lawyer at the brigade level or the battalion level. That was unheard of. That was just the commander's domain. So internally, there's a constant effort to figure out the best way to ensure compliance with the law. That happens a lot. There have been a few international criminal cases where the issue of proportionality has been raised. The Godovina case was one of those cases where General Godovina authorized an artillery attack against a, a building, an apartment building, where the president of the enemy forces resided and the trial chamber said, well, there were civilians there. You launched an artillery attack. It was disproportionate without any real analysis of the value of the attack. The appeals chamber reversed that finding and said that there was insufficient evidence to support the conclusion that the commander's judgment was uh, improper considering the value of disrupting the ability of the enemy president, the commander in chief of the enemy armed forces to engage in command and control during the operation. So to me, that was a win for the law because what it indicated was it's very difficult to recreate an attack decision and judge 
illegality unless you have something that is just outrageous. And remember what I said earlier, at the international criminal court level, it's not enough that the tribunal concludes that this anticipated civilian risk was excessive. They have to conclude that it was clearly excessive, which is like an aggravated form of violation. That's a very high burden for a prosecutor to satisfy. Yes, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, but there is a, a pretty crucial question from the audience that perhaps we can end with. Uh, it might seem a little strange as it, it's probably one that ought to have been at the beginning, um, but a request from our audience for some historical context in terms of where these laws come from and, and what their authority is. Now, of course, um, the development of the law of war perhaps famously began with uh, the 1868 St. Petersburg Declaration. Um, I appreciate that many of the observers in the audience might find the notion of there being laws governing warfare to be somewhat uh, incongruous, but could you take us as briefly as possible through the, the origins, perhaps Hague law, Geneva law, and what role customary international law plays in, in the rules that you have set out over the course of the last hour? So the most important point to recognize is that these rules were not developed by lawyers. These rules were developed by commanders. This was custom that evolved through the conduct of military operations. And back in the old days, when wars were fought, fought on battlefields remote from the civilian population, the focus of the law was primarily on um, ensuring that the conduct of hostilities was not conducted in a way that would basically allow for um, unjustified infliction of suffering on the enemy. For example, the prohibition on using weapons that were calculated to inflict unnecessary suffering or superfluous injury. An example from 1899 was glass projectiles, believe it or not, putting glass in your artillery round. Why? because X-ray technology had just emerged and an X-ray cannot detect the glass. So you're inflicting more injury than you have to. You could use metal shrapnel. It probably kill the enemy, but if the enemy survives, the enemy can be treated. World War II was, well, the, the lead up to World War II, the Spanish Civil War and then World War II created a new dilemma, which was how do we conduct military operations in a way that ensures that the civilians do not suffer excessively. And that became the genesis for a lot of development of the law. But the, the important point here is commanders understand that in war, their job is to employ their combat power in a way that brings about the submission of the enemy as efficiently and effectively as possible. That's what war is about. But war is also about doing that in a way that mitigates the risk to the innocent civilian. Otherwise, you're gonna compromise your own objective. I'm in Texas. The reason Texans remember the Alamo is not because the Battle of the Alamo was a great victory for Texas. It's because of the indiscriminate slaughter of the captives that was inflicted by General Santa Ana when he overran the Alamo instead of taking them prisoner. Or you can think of the Battle of the Bulge where the Germans massacred American soldiers at a place called Malmedy after they'd been captured. Commanders know that the maintenance of good order and discipline, that the protection of the moral integrity of their soldiers, that the achievement of strategic objectives is always enhanced by implementing these legal limits on the infliction of violence during armed conflict. And Mitigating the risk to the civilian population is essential to preserve legitimacy of your action. Because if you're fighting for a democracy and you have an indifference towards the suffering of the civilian population, there's an inherent inconsistency between your stated values and the conduct of your military operations. And again, I said it earlier, one of the most important consequences of this law that commanders understand is that they bear an obligation to protect their subordinates, not only from the mortal effects of combat, but also from the moral effects of combat. They're the ones who have to draw lines to maintain good order and discipline and to ensure 
that when the young men and women who fight go back home, they remain moral human beings and they understand the line between legitimate and illegitimate violence, even in war. And we shouldn't underestimate that. And I'll just finish by making a point. You know, I, when I talk about these rules and, and the compliance with the law by the IDF, I often get a reaction of, you're wasting your time. You're beating your head against the wall. The bias is so profound that people don't, the media doesn't care, the public doesn't care. But you know who does care? The soldiers who fight. And if all they ever hear is that they are kind of inhumane cyborgs who don't care about the infliction of, of suffering to civilians, at some point that has to have a corrosive effect on their morale. And it has to start to make them question the legitimacy of their commanders. So if nobody else in the world hears this discussion, other than members of the IDF who struggle through these difficult decisions or members of the US military or the British military or the French military who struggle through these difficult decisions and do the best they can in very, very miserable circumstances, then I've achieved something and we've achieved something. We have to keep talking about it because if we don't, what we're doing is acquiescing to the distorted, narr distorted narrative and the inherent delegitimization of the party to the conflict that actually owns legitimacy. And I'm not willing to do that. Such an important point to end on. Thank you so much. My apologies to the audience for so many questions that we simply didn't have time to get through. Um, but Professor Korn, it's been um, a packed hour. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I'm sure there'll be opportunities to have you back because there are so many questions that we- um, Let's do it. Time for. Um, you so call, I, I haul. <laughs> okay. I shall, I shall be holding you to that. I, I love doing this. Tremendously that's, grateful. And that's so exactly the point I made at the end. We have to talk about this in proper terms and we have to inform our friends and family members and colleagues that you can't just decide legality and legitimacy and morality on a news clip without knowing all of the details that go into the equation. That's wonderful. Um, thank you. Tremendously grateful for the time and you've uh, equipped our audience, no doubt, with the tools to do just that. Um, see you all again next time. Okay, bye bye. bye.